going live. Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to my shop. Tonight we are talking about saws and we are going to talk about a whole pile of different saws. What makes them different? What are their myths? What are the different types and how do you use them? And uh, we'll even dive into a little bit of the sharpening and other things like that. So we've got a lot to cover tonight. And if you have any questions, throw those in the chat. We will try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, on that line, if you are watching this recorded, you can go down in the description down below and in there you will see all of the questions listed out with timestamps beside them so you can quickly jump to whatever question you want rather than having to sit through the whole thing. If you just want to watch the certain questions, you can do that. Usually I go through the topic in the first 15 to 20 minutes and then after that is questions um, depending upon how much the topic carries on. So we'll see how that goes. Um, as to upcoming events, next week uh, we are doing the Q&A uh, the monthly Q&A, so it's all just random questions. Whatever you guys want me to answer, we'll be doing that. It'll be on Tuesday. Though my wife and I will probably be a little bit dazed because we'll just be getting back from a trip. So uh, stay tuned for that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, is there any notifications, anything I'm forgetting, babe? I don't think so. I think we're, we're good. So let's actually uh, jump oh, into this. If what? they hear giggles. Yes, if you have giggles, uh, my daughter here, Melody, lean a little forward. There she is. Hi. She's actually doing the, the camera work now, so we are Again. interning her for uh, doing camera work. Finally so, actually doing it. If you see anything happening on this camera, that's Melody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that means you got to be quiet, though. This is not all about you. I know. Yeah, yeah, that's what we thought. <laughs> mm -hmm. So tonight, uh, let's talk about saws. Now, the very first thing is the difference between cross cuts and rip, cross cut and rip cut. Um, it is two formats to the, the teeth. And when I first got into it, this is something that was very, very confusing to me. But basically, a rip cut is for ripping boards. It goes along the board. So if you imagine the board and you're ripping it down, that's the rip cut. A cross cut goes across the board. It's a cross cut. Um, and either one can do either things. You can rip with a cross cut and you can cross cut with a rip cut. It's just they're not quite as efficient for that. You get a cleaner cut with a cross cut but you get a faster, cleaner rip with a rip cut when you're ripping. So they each have their own places that they work, but if you need one or the other, both of them will do. Um, some people will tell you it is far more important to get a cross cut because uh, it is easier, you get a cleaner cut with a cross cut, even when you're ripping. However, some people will tell you it's better to get a rip cut because uh, it is easier to rip and you get a cleaner, straighter cut to rip and you can still cross cut, you're just going to get a ragged edge. So six of one half dozen another, usually I fall into the camp of it's better to get a cross cut uh, because it's easier to rip with a cross cut than it is to cross cut with a rip cut, but different people are going to have different things to say on that. So let me look at the specific differences. Um, number one, I should have grabbed the file earlier. We've got a, a saw file. Uh, and this is a saw file because it's triangular. Why don't you zoom in on that? And with a triangular file here, um, the three sides on this, it's actually six-sided. And the, the corner here is actually a tiny other side on that. Oop, you can just say you're good play. Um, and what you have on this is three sides. So this will be cutting the gullet in the sawtooth pattern. Let me grab my big saw. So, no, you can just keep it right there. It's fine. So on the big teeth on this, you can see that they are actually a 60 degree angle, so it fits the file in there exactly. Let me turn it this way. So this can fit in here. And um, the orientation of this file is what determines if it is a cross cut or a rip cut, um, as well as how aggressive the cut is. So let me talk about file orientations here. Back it up, Melody. Um, zoom it out. So what we've got here is there's three different ways you can put a file onto the, the saw, three different things. So like if you're in an airplane, you have your roll, your pitch, and your yaw. Um, and this you've got, you know, your roll, your pitch, and your yaw. There's three dimensions to it. Um, so what we've got is if you go straight across the saw, if you lean it one way or the other, that is the, um, that's the term I can never remember because it's the one that I never use. It's, um, oh, total mind blank. I can't remember that. Um, I, I never lean it one way though. though. There are some people who really talk about, ooh, you've got to lean it one way or the other for di particular, different particular types of cuts. I've not found that to be very useful. The other one is the roll of it. So I'm going to roll the file forward and backward. That is called the rake. Uh, the rake is very important. 
if you roll it forward so that your tooth is more aggressive, it's got this hook that runs out and actually is very, very aggressive and takes off a lot of material. If you roll it back, then rather than having this hook that comes up, you just have this mountain point that sticks up and scratches the wood. It's not as aggressive, but you'll get a cleaner cut. And then the next one is the fleam. So this is what you get in the back of your throat, uh, but that's what the file rotates this way. And it's that that determines if it's a cross cut or a rip cut. All of the other movements can be done with any of the particular types of saw. But the fleam is what determines if it's a cross cut or a rip cut. If the file goes 90 degrees to the plate like this, then it's a rip cut. If the file leans to any amount of angle, then it's a cross cut. So and that's the whole difference to it. Could I just imagine ripping a piece of paper that goes up and down? I guess if you want to. Okay, that's how I would visualize <laughs> it. That's so a rip, a rip cut goes all the way across. And let me actually show what that means. If you look very closely at the teeth, and I'm not going to be able to show it really closely because I don't have my, that would take long to set up. You have two different things that you have. You have a chisel and a knife. A cross cut has a whole bunch of knives, knives, knives in it. A rip cut has a whole bunch of chisels in it. So if you imagine you're ripping a board, you want to take the chisel and use it to plow a curl in front of the chisel. That's ripping. And so a saw that's rip cut has a whole bunch of chisels, ping, 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 and those will rip into it. Whereas a cross cut has a whole bunch of knives and the knife will be, have a point on one side and the next tooth will have the point on the other side and the next tooth will have the point on the other side. And so you've got all these knives in rows going across and as it cuts across the wood, rather than peeling it out like a plane, this will slice two grooves on either side and those grooves will slice across the fibers and they will, they will cut and sever the fibers as opposed to peeling them out. And so with a cross cut, you've got all these knives cutting down to slice the wood. So if you can imagine taking a board, and if I had my knife, I can cut across the fibers very easily. But if I come in with a chisel and I try to cut into it this way, I'm just gonna get all of these splinters coming out. Here, let me focus in on this. So if I got my chisel here and I run across it, I'm just gonna get all of these splinters coming out. And so I'm getting a really ragged cut. But He's if I came in with a knife. a chisel at my child as she <laughs> if I come in with a knife, I can sever the fibers here and here. And each time I come in, I'm making this groove a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. And that's a much, much cleaner cut than I would be able to get with a, uh, with a rip cut. So that is the difference between rip cut and cross cut. It's a chisel or a, it's a, chisel or a knife. I'm going to try and keep cross cut over here and rip cut over here. Now once you understand the difference between the two of them, then you can start to work into all of the other saw types. And in most cases, saws tend to come in pairs. And that pair is a cross cut and a rip cut. But in most cases, the rip cut is the bigger saw. The slight variation to that is when you get down to the small dovetail saw. The small dovetail saw is technically supposed to be filed as a rip cut because you're cutting into the end grain of the wood. You're ripping down in. However, with a dovetail saw, you want a very fine cut. You want something that leaves a really nice clean edge. And so most people put a little bit of fleam into it, just 10 degrees or so. You're taking the, the file, rather than going 90 degrees off, they're going about 10 degrees off of that. That's not a lot in there, but technically, it's a rip cut if you do that. And so the dovetail is kind of the gray area between the two. Some people put a little bit in there. Some people also call that the hybrid cut because it's not quite an aggressive um, cross cut. Most cross cuts at about 30 degrees off of 90. So 60 degrees or 30 degrees, depending upon which side of the angle you're on. <laughs> um, whereas if you're doing a hybrid cut, it's only about 10 degrees off. So it's not off that much. So this one generally doesn't come in pairs. The small, dainty dovetail saw um, is kind of by itself. When you get into the pairs, we've got a carcass saw. A uh, carcass saw is a crosscut saw. And unfortunately, Veritas has very, very confused things 
because they offer the carcass saw in both a cross cut and a rip cut, which just drives educators crazy because a carcass saw by name is a cross cut saw. If you put rip teeth in it, then it's a tenon saw. Um, and a tenon saw is a back saw with rip teeth. Now you notice the tenon saw is bigger than the carcass saw. Not by a whole lot, but enough. And the tenon saw is designed for cutting tenons. So this will cut down the cheek of a tenon. A carcass saw is probably the most used saw in the shop. If you have to buy one saw, buy a carcass saw. This is the saw that most of your joinery will be done with. This is the cross cut saw. So this is where you cut the boards to length. This is where you cut the, uh, the shoulders of your tenon. So if you are doing most of your joinery work is done with a carcass saw. Tenon saws are usually only there for when you need to cut tenons. Um, and you're only cutting the cheek of the tenon. The shoulder of the tenon is then done with the carcass saw. So then we can move up a step and we can get into our panel saws. Panel saws are these, they are a panel. And they are 24 inches or less without a back. If they are longer than 24 inches, then they're a hand saw, which gets really confusing because most people think all of these are hand saws because they're run with your hand. No, a hand saw is a panel saw that is longer than 24 inches. Usually 26 inches is a hand saw. And most of the time you're going to find the cross cut in a panel saw and the hand saw with rip cut teeth. And that's because with rip cutting, you're doing larger boards, you're doing longer cuts, and it's nicer to have that little bit longer size. Whereas with cross cutting, it's rare that I'm cross cutting a board that's more than 12 inches or so. And so you don't need a really long cross cut saw. And so you get into that. Uh, and then they go up from that. And usually the biggest ones are rip cut, like my Rubo style frame saw. That's a rip cut. The, um, the, the, cross-cut version of that is then the buck saw and this is for cutting logs to length um, so if you would cut 18 inch logs to then split into firewood you would cut them to length with a buck saw it's called that because you would cut them on a saw buck and then you use a buck saw to cut on the saw on the buck on the saw the the the, the, the saw buck and so you kind of get that, that, that feel. And most of the time, the way you choose which saw to use is number one, you ask yourself is how clean does this need to be? If it needs to be really clean, then you're probably going to want a saw with smaller teeth. The smaller the teeth, the cleaner the cut. But the smaller the teeth, the slower the cut. And if you've got a long, big cut to make, you generally don't care about being too clean, but you wanna get that cut done, so you get big teeth like this. These are uh, five PPI teeth, really big honking teeth. I'm just listen to honk, honk, honk. Um, yeah, this will cut a lot, but it's not gonna leave a very clean surface. Big teeth, not clean, but much faster. And so then you have to ask yourself is how big is what you're cutting? Because usually you want enough work, enough blade coming out either side. When you cut through the board, you wanna make sure that your teeth can eject the sawdust. So if this is a 24 inch saw and I'm cutting something that is, uh, let's say 20 inches, I'm gonna have four inches of saw that's coming out and so that means that the majority of this saw is going to stay inside the work. And all those teeth that stay inside the work aren't going to be able to get rid of their sawdust and they're gonna start clogging up. So you never want to cut anything that is less than half the length of your, that is more than half the length of your saw. So if you have a 24 inch saw, don't cut anything longer than 12 inches. Um, you know, there's some caveats to that. Yes, you could carry it past and move the saw out of the cut one way and out of the cut on the other way. But in general, you don't want to cut anything larger than half the length of your saw. So if you're doing dovetails, you're only going through a three quarter inch board. You don't need a long saw. You can use a small dedicated saw. But if I'm cutting, um, if I'm rip cutting long boards, I don't want to use this because number one, the back is going to get in the way. And number two, it's just so short that I'm going to be spending forever cutting on it. Um, 
So there's a quick run over of cross cut, rip cut, and what you use, when you use. You'll see that I have a lot of saws on here, and I recently did a video actually going through them and explaining which ones do I use, which ones I don't use. I would say probably around 80% of the saw time that I use, I'm using this saw, a simple carcass. This one is from Veritas. Um, I really like it. I use it all the time. Someday I'll probably upgrade it to something that feels a little bit better, but this saw is phenomenal for the price. The next most common one I use is my hand saw, is I'm ripping a lot of boards. I want something quick that can rip down a lot of things. The next most common one I use is the tenon saw. Now, one of the things you may have realized is that a lot of people immediately think the first good hand-powered saw you need is a dovetail saw. This is down the list of ways. It's probably fourth or fifth. I might use my cross-cut panel saw before I use this one. This is really only used for small, delicate, in-grain cuts um, that are, need precision and clean work, which really aren't that many. So I don't use this one that much. This is not the first saw you should get. It should probably be a carcass saw or a hand saw, and then you can go from there. Now this is what you're gonna find in most big box stores. It's a cross-cut saw, it is a panel saw, and honestly, if you really pushed yourself, you could do all your work with a cross-cut panel saw, and that's why it's the one you find the most. Because you can do all of your cross-cutting in there. If you wanted to, you could do dovetails with this. Uh, you can rip boards with this. It's not gonna be great at it, but it's kind of the jack of all trades when it comes to saws. And so that's why you're gonna be finding that in the stores. If you are going to be doing dovetails and you're looking for something cheap, get a hacksaw, uh, preferably one that actually has a blade. Um, but actually a hacksaw makes a really good dovetail saw. It's a fine blade, little teeth, it cleans up really well, um, and a hacksaw will actually do pretty well for dovetails. Not as comfortable or as nice, but it works. So, um, 16, that, yeah. Um, one of the things I haven't talked about is Japanese saws. Uh, one of the reasons why is I'm not as comfortable with using them. It's not something I'm expertise since I don't talk about them that much. Um, the difference between pull and push cut Almost all western saws, all back saws, um, panel saws, they all are push saws. They cut on the push stroke. Um, most um, Japanese saws cut on the pull stroke. And you'll have some people who will tell you that one or the other is far more ergonomic and is, you get more power doing that. That's total hooey. Um, you don't get more power pulling or pushing. They're both the exact same thing. They're just different body mechanics and it all comes down to how you hold it and how you push it, you can get just as much power out of one or the other. Um, it all comes down to preference. Some people like to pull, some people like to push. Um, when it comes to actual efficiency, um, a push saw is easier to control. In other words, it takes less effort to control. Now, I know that's really going to confuse some people because when you're first getting into it, a pull saw is far easier simpler and easier to use. You find that you get a much straighter cut with a pull saw, but that's because this actually takes more force to control. I know that's a little confusing, but let me explain. When you are cutting, if I'm cutting through the board, on a push stroke, the tooth that is leading the cut is on my side of the board. So as I'm pushing through it, the leading tooth is the tooth on my side of the board. And so that being, any slight movement to my hand, any little twist, any little movement is going to make that curve, that line curve one way or the other. It's going to make it move just with the slightest touch. With a pole saw, the leading tooth is on the other side of the board, and I have to put a lot of force into it to get it to move one way or the other. And that sounds like it's going to make this harder to steer and that easier to steer. The problem is, that most people when they're getting into it with a push saw, they over control it because just even thinking about it one way or the other is often too much pressure. And it will go all the way off and you're suddenly going off this way and then you're coming back this way just because you're over controlling it. Whereas with a Japanese saw, when you set it up and you put it on that line, it's gonna go straight down whatever line you set it up on. But if you set it off ever so slightly off the line and it starts going off that line, it becomes a lot of work to pull it back onto the line. So it's kind of one of those things of, this is great for the beginner. It is something that is easy to learn because it takes a little bit more force to control. And that's good because most beginners are putting a lot of force into it. 
this takes a lot more skill to learn. Um, it takes a lot more time to get down, and so it kind of gets frustrating. So if you're getting frustrated with a Western saw, try out a, uh, try out a Japanese saw. You might be very surprised with how easy they are to get to going because they don't take that um, crazy amount of force. But the nice thing is now that I have the skill to it, I can guide this saw with incredible precision and I have the ability to do turns and bring it back and forth with very little effort. Um, if I'm running into something like this and the grain starts taking it away one way, I have to spend a lot more effort trying to get that leading tooth on the back side to where I want it to be. So one thing to think about between the two, one is not better than the other. They each have their pros and cons and it is, uh, it's wide open. Some people love one, some people love the other, some people like both. That's the, the fun of it. So um, I think that's about it for the, the regular talk. Let's start jumping into questions because it looks like we have a few. So what do we got, babe? Let's see. What did the old farmer have? How do you tell if a sharpening stone is water or oil and does it ruin the stone if you use the wrong fluid? The old farmer, thank you. Um, this is, he actually sent this one to me ahead of time and I promised I would answer it today. So let's actually jump into that one. How do you tell if a whetstone is water or oil? Now, this is a confusing point. A lot of people will hear whetstone and they think water stone. Whetstone is something you have to put a fluid into. It's water or it's oil, that they're both whetstones. Um, the difference between an oil stone and a water stone, now I'm gonna start a bunch of arguments here because there are lots of purists that say, no, this particular type of stone should always be used with oil or this particular type of stone should always be used with water. Honestly, that's just personal preference. Um, take it with a grain of salt when someone says that. Um, a whetstone that is for oil is one that has oil in it. A whetstone for water is one that has had water in it. Now you can turn a water stone into an oil stone by putting oil into the water stone. But you can't turn an oil stone into a water stone by putting, oil in, by putting water in it because the oil will repel the water out of it. Um, but because water will naturally run out of a stone very quickly and it will dry up, um, you can introduce oil into a water stone. But because the oil doesn't run out of an oil stone and it doesn't really dry up out of the oil stone, you can't get more water in there. Um, so once you put oil into it, it's an oil stone. Um, but if it's water, you could, in theory, in the future, put oil into it. Um, as to the differences in function, oil stones are great because after sharpening it, you can go straight into the work. You're not going to worry about... <laughs> I still have all my fingers. <laughs> You're not going to worry um, about um, rusting your blade. If you're using water on your stones, you need to make sure you completely clean them off. You want to make sure you get all of the moisture off of this, otherwise you're going to start getting these rust spots on there. Um, especially if you sharpen it and then put it away, you need to make sure you get it completely dry. Um, so a lot of people who are working on the bench and they're working at the project, that's where an oil stone is great because you can just quickly use it and go back to it. Especially if you're using it um, out with like green woodworking where you have a scythe or something like that and you need to sharpen it out in the field. An oil stone is great because it has the oil in it already. It's not something that you have to soak and keep wet. Um, now some people would actually have a wet pouch that they could put their water stone into and then sharpen their scythe when they're out in the field. Um, though most people would use an oil stone because it would stay oiled. Um, so, yeah, good question. Let's jump into the next one. What do we got? I don't know. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Rebel Robot. What is that? What do you look for when buying vintage open handle dovetail or back saw? And how slash where do you buy replacement saw blades for old saws? Okay. Um, this is going to be one of the, one of the eye-opening things. When you are looking at a saw, whatever saw it is, the most important saw, part of the saw, it is not the plate. It is not the back. The most important part of the saw is the handle. That is what sets all the saws apart, is how comfortable is it to you. If it is comfortable, then it becomes an extension of your arm. It becomes something that you can run without thinking about it. If it is uncomfortable, then you're thinking about your hand and you're thinking about other things into it and that actually comes into effect to the saw. And so a lot of times you'll see saws that have been molded and reshaped to fit the user's hand. The handle is the most important part. Get something that fits your hand and is comfortable and something you like 
because if you like it, if you feel good using it, then you will have much better results. The plate is only as good as the last person who sharpened it. Uh, I can give you the best saw that is set up absolutely perfectly and you can use it for a while and it's going to get dull. And then it's only as good as how well you can sharpen it or how well you can pay someone else to sharpen it. The, the plate is really kind of superfluous to uh, should I get something good because you can get a bad saw and sharpen it up really well and it will treat you really well. The quality of the steel is also something that is rather superfluous because they're all made out of spring steel. They're all made out of a rather soft steel that you can use a file and you can cut it. Um, they're, it's not something you have to really worry about the steel quality. When it gets to backs, there's some people who want a folded back, some people who want one or the other. Um, Veritas makes uh, these polymer backs, which are kind of a drawback to them because they, they pinch things in place and a lot of people don't like them. I actually kind of like them because they are lighter. Um, it gives me a little more control. When I start getting into some of the big brass backs and steel backs, these things are heavy. There is a lot of force on them because that back puts a lot of weight into it. Um, and some people like that because they're not having to do any force into it. They just let the saw with all of its weight do all the cutting. Personally, I find I actually have to lift that weight off of the saw because it's too much weight, um, but personal preference. So when you're looking for it, what I want to look at, number one, here, Melody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, big shot to that. Go for it. Um, I'm actually going to be looking at the handle, and I want to see, is the handle something that was sculpted by someone? Is it something that someone took a file to and shaped? Uh, you see how this one has these flat sides on it with these lines? That means that a router went around this. Someone and didn't put a lot of work on it. Just, just leave it alone. You're fine. Um, someone, let go. There you go. Just let it sit once it's there. Um, someone just ran a router on this and didn't spend a whole lot of work on that one. However, this one was made by Bearcat. There are no lines on this. A router went around it to begin with and then he brought in a file and he reshaped it so you have a progressive angle here. This is a, um, a larger radius than this is and that's a different radius than this is. He actually went through this and he hand shaped this to fit the handle. Um, so you can see that there was hand work done on this to give it more of a uh, organic shape to it. And that's one of the things that I see. If you see a handle that has a lot of ornamentation on it and has some extra work into it, you know that someone spent some time to make this handle what it should be. And that lets you know you have a good saw. If you see a handle that's got a lot of flat, simple sides on it, like uh, this one here, um, you can tell, it's good, leave it alone. You can tell this one is a really cheap handle. It's not going to be comfortable. This is just, that's trash. And this is going to tell you about the rest of the saw. If the saw is not comfortable, if the saw, if the handle didn't take a lot of effort to make, you can tell the rest of it's probably not going to be that good. Now you can always reshape the handle to be, your, be what you like, but this is also a really good indicator of the rest of the saw. If they cheaped out on the handle, they cheaped out on the rest of it. Most of the time. There's a few caveats to that, such as uh, um, PAX saws. Uh, here, grab this one. Um, PAX saws have these really cheap handles. Uh, I really don't like those. But the rest of the saw, they've actually spent a good bit of time on it with a good folded brass back. They're really nice saws. So a lot of people buy the PAX saws and they'll reshape the handle to be something very comfortable. I actually have a video um, doing this one and reshaping um, that one for what I like to do. So, yeah, that's what you should be looking for. Is look at the handle, and it will tell you a lot about the rest of the saw. So we've had two super chats. Ah, what we got? We have Alan. He's donating to the Band-Aid Fund. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, we actually ran out of those the other day. Yeah. Sliced up my thumb and went upstairs and like, Sarah's, oh, yeah, Sarah used the last one yesterday. <laughs> and then... His super chat question is, will you do a short demo on sharpening again? He goes, I know you have videos. Um, I won't. I, the last time I did sharpening in a live, it was disastrous because sharpening is, yay, 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 and it's just, it's bad for lives. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. Watch the other videos. I have lots of good detailed videos on it. <laughs> I'm 
sorry, everybody. <laughs> and then Kenny and Janet Horn also super chatted. We'll spare you that lovely sound. <laughs> Are you ready? Oh, you got a joke, and I, I got, got I got one too. Ready? My mom always told me growing up that I could be whoever I wanted to be, but she was wrong. Identity theft is a crime. <laughs> <laughs> right. For the other super chat, I got one I heard today. And okay, I, go ahead. I absolutely love it. Right. So a moth goes to a podiatrist. And the podiatrist talks to the moth and says, okay, uh, what, 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 brought, what brought you in today? What's, what's, what problems are you having? He's like, oh, you wouldn't believe it. I, I, my, my father just passed away. And I think, I, I honestly think it was my uncle who murdered him. And uh, come to find out, my, my mother is now dating him, and I'm having all sorts of problems in my life, and everything is just absolutely messed up. And the podiatrist looks at the moth and says, well, what, what, I think you need to go see a psychiatrist. I'm a, I'm a podiatrist. What, what, what brought you in to me? And the moth said, oh, your light was on. <laughs> that was a long run for a short slide. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> Jack Royal just super chatted as well and says, why don't you get a number one? Because his wife won't let him. <laughs> um, <laughs> number ones are, for all intents and purposes, useless. Now, that doesn't mean you can't find uses for them, but they're not really good at anything that another plane isn't better at. Um, so they don't have a lot of uses, but they are so collectible that their price is, uh, honestly, I could buy, I think I could actually buy all of my planes on this rack for the price of one number one. Um, so yeah, that's why I haven't purchased a number one. I'd rather buy all of these. <laughs> What's next? Okay. Oh, you got one? Why doesn't James Bond fart in bed? Because it would blow his cover. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, that's for my wife. You now you can see why he married her. <laughs> What's the next question? <laughs> if we can ever get one out of You apparently don't have that problem. <laughs> What a poor man ass. Can the, <clears throat> can the tiny files from Wally World work for sharpening saw blades? And if not, what would be a cost-effective option? Uh, I think you're talking about files like uh, like needle files. So you can get these um, you know, tiny little things, like these little things. Um, in general, no. Um, what you want to look for... Uh, come in onto this. And uh, what you want to look for is, number one, you want that triangular shaped file. And any triangular shaped file will do, even if it's really, really dirty like this. The thing you want is you want to make sure that the file um, doesn't go more than halfway into the tooth. And you can see in this case, this tooth here reaches, here, why don't you zoom in right on my, my fingertip, Melody. This tooth here reaches in a little bit past halfway on this file. And that means that this file is too small for this tooth. And the reason being is I'm going to wear out the middle of this face before I wear out the edges. And that is a problem because the most important place in the file is the middle of that face. Because the middle of that face, face is what sharpens the very cutting edge of the tooth. And that cutting edge of the tooth is the most important, and therefore the middle of your file is the most important. In other words, you don't want that tooth to go in past the middle of the file, or you're going to wear out the middle of your file faster than anything else. Now, as to um, cost-effective files, honestly, going to the big box store and buying the cheapest triangular file you get there will be a great use of money, and it's probably the most cost-effective way of doing it. It will be a cheaper saw, and it, a cheaper file, and it might end up being a little bit louder because the, the teeth are a little bit larger, but it will still cut fine. 
and you'll get a great cut out of it. The downside to it is it won't last as long. You might get six, seven, maybe eight sharpenings out of it, and you gotta go get a new one. But hey, they're five bucks a piece. Um, you go to uh, get the really nice ones, like I have a set here from, I have a set back up and so you can show this whole thing. Uh, this is from Lee Valley, and uh, this set, um, whoop, let me back it up, there you go. You can focus on that. Uh, this set's from uh, Lee Valley. Most of these are Baco. Yeah, most of these are Baco. Um, and these are very expensive files. They're, you know, 30, 40 bucks a piece. The difference between these and this one, so like here, these two are basically the same, but this one has a much finer tooth on it. And this one has a much more coarse and aggressive tooth. Um, but this steel is actually a little bit better steel than this. And so this will last longer than this one will. And most of the time, you're not going to get, you know, per dollar. So if this cost $6 and gave me six sharpenings, that doesn't mean that a $30, $30 file will give me 30 sharpenings. I'll probably only get 20 out of it. So per sharpening, the most cost-effective method is to get the cheap file. However, if you're doing a lot of sharpening, you will really like working with a good file because they are quieter, they are smoother, they feel good but all those things really don't equate to the quality of the sharpening. Um, other than the fact of you'll probably sharpen more often with a good file than you will with a bad file because it's more enjoyable to sharpen with a good file. But honestly, going to the big box store and getting a cheap triangular file will treat you perfectly fine. Um, don't worry about the quality of the file. There is no correlation between the quality of the file and the quality of the final product. Um, it's just more fit and finish and how comfortable it is for you. Very good question though. What's next? Well, all I can say is Hopman 6 just became my favorite person. <laughs> what the say? question of us, because I didn't, we ran out of band-aids and I was going to buy some on the way to work. And my mistake was assuming you wouldn't injure yourself for 12 hours. <laughs> and they said, how long have you been married? And I said 15. He goes, you don't look old enough for that. So the heat is not my favorite. <laughs> I was a baby when I got married. Yes, I married her before she turned 21. Yeah, Bruce. All right, Penny and Janet Horn. What is more difficult to sharpen, a saw or a plane iron? Um, a, a saw is, is far more difficult. It takes longer. There are more steps involved. Um, a plane iron, you pull it out, and you go, chink, 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 and you're done. You're back into it. And most plane irons... Um, once I have it out, it's less than a minute from dull to sharp and back into the plane. Um, a saw is usually going to be, for someone who knows what they're doing and taking the time on it, um, a good sharpening is 20, 30 minutes. For someone first getting into it, a sharpening may be an hour or more to get a, a good sharpening on there. Um, so it's one of those things that <laughs> there's lots of steps to it. You've got to joint all the teeth and make sure that they are all flat. Um, because you're going to wear out the teeth in the middle far faster than you're going to wear out the teeth in the end. And that means that they eventually get lower. You don't want a gullet in there. Um, if anything, you actually want a hump on the saw. Um, so you have a single point of contact rather than a wrapped point of contact. Um, and so you need to joint all the teeth down to the same level. And then you have to go through and sharpen half of them one direction. Turn the saw around and sharpen half the other direction. And, uh, and then you get into a cross cut and then you have to think about not only the rake that you're putting onto it, but then also the, the, the fleam of which angle are you going to be putting on that and then making sure those are all the same. Um, it, it, there's a lot more that goes into sharpening a, a saw. Um, and if you want to see it, type into the search engine, wood by right, how to sharpen crosscut saw. Wood by right, how to sharpen car uh, carcass saw. Wood by right, how to sharpen dovetail saw. I've got a video on every type of saw out there and I've got videos on comparisons between them. I probably have uh, what, 15 to 20 videos just on sharpening saws, um, as well as the dreaded live that I did, sharpening one live. Um, yeah, turn down the sound. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that brings me back. Um, one of the common questions I get is, how do I tell if my saw is dull? Because over time, it gets, it gets less and less efficient, but it does it slow enough that you don't notice it. It's like boiling the frog. Um, you know, eventually it gets to the point where you're thinking, is it just bad or am I not doing well? 
and then you sharpen it and you use it the first time. It's like, oh, wow, this feels awesome. And it's amazing how good it feels. And, and it just slowly gets worse. The best way that I've found to explain to people what a dull saw is until you actually know that, that feeling of a dull saw is feel the teeth in the middle. And then bring your hand out to the very last couple on the end. Because you're using these teeth and these teeth will get dull quickly. And if there's a big difference between these teeth and these teeth, it's dull. It needs to be sharpened. Um, and you'll find, I, I, I just kind of touch the teeth and a good sharp saw kind of grabs your fingers. Um, they, they stick. They, they take a little bit of effort to pull off. There's a dull saw, you can touch it and it's, just, it's touching something that's pointy. Um, so yeah, compare the center teeth with the back few teeth and you'll see the difference between sharp, uh, sharp and dull because you, you rarely use the last few teeth on here. Um, and if you do, you don't use them nearly as much as you use that. So. so now they want to know what is boiling a frog. What's that? Why are you boiling a frog? Frog legs. It tastes good. <laughs> Although I've heard, I've heard mixed rumors on that, that saying being not true. It'd be interesting to try sometime and see I've if it is. I've never eaten frog legs. I wouldn't know. What's that? What did you say? I said I wouldn't know. Oh. What's next? Um, E.G. Blue Suede wants to know, how do I identify back saw types from tool swaps? The cross grip, grip carcass dovetail. I know you were talking about the way of the teeth. Okay, yeah, that's most of them in there. Um, so there are three main types of back saws. Number one, you have your dovetail saws. Dovetail saws are small, they're delicate, they're not very deep because they don't have to cut in very deep. Um, this is actually a fairly long dovetail saw. Um, Bad Axe makes one called the Stiletto that's about that long, which is a really, really long dovetail saw. Um, a lot of dovetail saws are actually a lot shorter, like this one. Um, and uh, yeah, dovetail saws are the little ones. Then the next step up is your carcass saw. And a carcass saw is kind of the middle range. It's usually around 12, 14 inches long. Um, it's got two, maybe three inches of depth. It's got cross-cut teeth. Um, so if you look at the teeth really closely, they all look like knives rather than looking like chisels. Um, and then the next one is your tenon saw. Now, occasionally you'll come across a sash saw, which is kind of the in-between of these two. Um, and honestly, you're going to be... The sash saw is kind of like a tenon saw with cross-cut, but some people will say a sash saw is just a big tenon saw. Um, and honestly, a saw is what you use it to do. If I cut dovetails with a hacksaw, that makes the hacksaw a dovetail saw because I cut dovetails with it. Um, and there have been times where I've cut dovetails with my carcass saw because it was there. It was quicker and easier to do that. I didn't need something really fine or delicate. Um, so you don't really need anything like that. Just ask yourself, what hole do you have in your saw collection in length? in sawtooth size, in um, form of cut. Um, because you don't need that many. There's like five or six main sizes until you start getting into really specialty sizes that are um, less common. Uh, the other one you'll often hear um, is, uh, this one would be a tenon saw, but uh, sometimes you'll see one that looks like a tenon saw, except for it has cross-cut teeth, and it's like that long. That's a miter box saw. Um, so it's actually designed to fit into a miter box and has a long back on it that it can ride on. Um, and so those are designed to work with a particular miter box. Um, so, yeah. What's next? So is that a sailing number four? Or whatever, the saw that you just had? No. Is there? I don't know. This is a Stanley number four. I know. Someone was saying Stanley four series miter boxes. Oh, the miter box. Um, yeah, I, I'm not familiar enough with that to know numbering on those. Okay. Because there are, there are, once you get into saws, there is a lot of history diving into it. Um, because you have series of saws and you have ages of saws, um, and then you have particular types of saws. Uh, Melody, Melody. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's lots of things into it. And so you look at the medallion on the saw. The medallion is the, the big nut and it has the logo in there. 
Um, and a lot of times you'll see a nut that says Warrantied Superior. Warrantied Superior is not a brand name. That is what saw companies would put on them and sell them as seconds. So they're not up to the full quality of the nice ones. So they didn't brand them. They'd put the Warrantied Superior on there. Um, and so several different brands put Warrantied Superior. So if you have Warrantied Superior on there, you have to look at other things to find out what is actually the brand of that saw. Um, and some of the nuts are slightly different, so you can tell that apart, but some of the nuts changed over time, so it gets really confusing. I'm not a saw history aficionado. That is um, not my forte. There's way too much research on that for me. <laughs> What's next? Jose Mejia asked, how do I turn a rip saw into a crosscut saw? Uh, what you do is if, it's, if it is a rip saw, that means that the file was last put at 90 degrees to it. To turn it into a crosscut saw, next time you file it, you rotate the file to 30 degrees. And you file every other tooth at 30 degrees this way. And then you turn around and you go the opposite direction, every other, every other tooth in between 30 degrees the other direction. And what that does is you imagine your saw, your, your knife here. And the knife is like this, this bubble, beveled edge with the, the two bevels is you have the file going across at, if it were at 90 degrees, then you'd just be cutting a chisel. But if it's a knife, you actually need to rotate it to cut the knife edge. And so this side would be cut this way, and this side would be cut that way. And so you'd have 30 degrees this way, 30 degrees that way. Um, so if you want to turn a cross cut into a rip cut, you take the file from 30 degrees and you move it to 90 degrees and vice versa. It just depends on how you rotate the saw, how you rotate the file. And yes, you can switch them back and forth. Um, just be careful. If you get a saw from a big box store or something that was made in the last 30 years, there's a very good chance that the teeth are hardened. And you'll see that the, the edges, the very tips of all the teeth are black or if it's brand new, they'll be blue. Um, and that means the teeth have been hardened and they are often very close to just as hard as a file. So if you try to sharpen hardened teeth with a regular steel file, you're going to ruin your steel file. You might get the saw a little bit sharper, but you're going to ruin your file. Um, and so if they are hardened, you can either get a big diamond file, which those are very expensive, or you can grind off all the teeth and put in new teeth. But, oh, and as a, as a note, um, saw plates, they're made of simple spring steel. Um, and so you can get um, online spring steel. You can order it on Amazon um, and just get the thickness you want and the dimensions you want, and it'll be shipped out to you, and you can cut it into whatever shape you want. Um, oh, I, one other thing I want to talk about is kinks and bends. Um, if you're looking at a saw and you see it as a kink, in other words, there's a, there's a fine point where it suddenly bends. Ow, slice my finger. Mm, nice. Um, and it suddenly bends. Uh, that's a kink. Kinks are almost impossible to get out of a saw. With a really skilled person and a hammer and an anvil and 30 to 40 minutes, you can tap a kink out, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of patience, and if you do it wrong, you're just going to put another kink into the blade. Um, so kinks pretty much mean that the saw is trash. However, if it's bent, here, let me put, let me put a bend in this one. So I'm actually going to bend this around. See, I'm taking the toe all the way back to the handle, and now, Nope, I gotta go a little more than that. That was just a bad plan. <laughs> okay, I've got a bend in this now. Here, Melody, turn it up so it's looking up, looking along the saw. Can no. Again? Yeah, I will once once you're in here. So focus on my hand here. You got it. All right. So I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to see this or not, but there's a slight bend in this, and it's a very very gradual bend along here. So to fix that. All I do is I bend it the other way. <laughs> and I'll bend it back. And I'll see. Actually, that was a bit too much. Bend it back the other way. And the bend is a little more over here now. So I'm just going to work on that spot. I could just see a new TikTok and series of people more bending like that. their saws. And there. Now it's <laughs> yeah. back to straight. Um, so you can straighten out a saw doing the same thing. Um, if a back saw has a wave in it, um, it depends on the type of saw. If the back saw is a cut slit, um, like this one here, focus on my hand right here. Uh, this one is actually a cut back, and so the back has been glued into place. 
Uh, this is a poly, um, and so it's glued into place. But this one, this one is a folded back. A folded back means it used to be a flat piece of steel, but it was wrapped all the way around one side and around the other. So a folded back has an added benefit. If you have a folded back and it's wavy, all you do is you lay it flat on the bench so the back is sitting on the bench, and you get one good tap. And what that'll do is it'll set the plate back down in there, and any waviness in it, that back will straighten it out, and you'll clean up your plate just like that. And so a folded back is really nice for that, because if you suddenly catch on a board, and you're putting too much force into it, a folded back will deform by pulling it out of the plate, and so you'll start to get that waviness in there. If your back is a, form, is a cut back or a polymer back and it catches, it's not going to be able to deform in the back, it's actually going to bend and kink the plate. And uh, this one, you're focused on the plate there, this one I've got a big kink right up here. Um, and so the last two inches of the blade turn ever so slightly off to the side. Um, so I have to remember when I'm cutting with this, I don't use the last two inches of it because this is now bad. It got caught, and you can see I actually broke out a piece of the polymer here. Um, and that, yeah, that's the problem. If it's not a folded back, you can run into issues that way. What's next? Um, Michael Curry wants to know, do you file starter teeth on your rip saws? No. No. Uh, there are people who really like that, and so uh, what you'll get is smaller teeth right up here at the very end. And the idea on that is when I'm ripping, with smaller teeth it's a little easier to get started, so I can start those out there. The problem is my hand is so far away that the control on that is an absolute pain. I don't want to start the teeth out there. I want to start the teeth back here where I've got more control. And so I'm not going to file smaller teeth on that. It just makes it less efficient. But there are people who like to start way out there, and they like to do that. Paul Sellers is one. I personally think he's a little crazy for that, but everyone's a little different. Um, personally, I prefer just to start it where I started. And the trick to starting with big teeth is don't let the saw rest on the wood. Just move it so it's above the work, and you get it going back and forth, and then slowly engage it down into what you want, and it'll suddenly start cutting. Um, you don't really need to, to do that. It's just a skill thing. Um, so I prefer to have all the teeth nice and big all the way along, because then I get the full use of the saw at its full aggressiveness. But in the end, very personal preference. Everyone's different. What's next? No. Let's see. I have... I. I probably have more questions than we're going to get to at this point now. Cool. We'll do what um, we can. Andrew Seymour asks, well, what's a miter back saw? Is it a hybrid? A miter back saw is a saw for a miter saw. Um, so in other words, like we were talking about earlier with the, with the uh, miter box saws, they are long back saws. Um, so yeah. Also, um, miter box saws do not have any cant. In other words, it's the same distance from the teeth to the back here as it is here. Whereas with a lot of other antique saws, um, like this little dovetail saw, it's a smaller distance here and a bigger distance back here. Um, the benefit for that is if you're cutting on the board, you always want to be conservative on the other side of the board. So if it's thinner here and you're cutting flat, that means you're going you're to hit your line on your side of the board before you hit the depth mark on the other side of the board. And then it just takes one more cut, lean it down, and you're done. Um, and so having that cant, where it is thinner here than it is here, um, gives you that little bit of safety. But uh, miter box saws are flat all the way across. What's next? Let's see. Jose Mejia asks, what are saws with round handles for? Saws with round handles. I don't know. Are there saws that just have... Not that I know of. I mean, there are... You have saws like this. Um, this is called a gent saw, um, and so it's kind of like a Japanese saw, except for it cuts on the push. Um, I despise these things. I find them to be the most annoying, and bleh. I actually just use this one for cutting some brass stock because I don't care about the teeth on it, so I'd rather just cut it through with this than um, pull out other things. So, yeah, I don't like these, but other people really do, um, but if that's what you mean by a round handle, um, yeah, it's a gent saw. Um, most commonly, it is the cheaper version of the dovetail saw. And you can see it's basically the same thing, just a different handle format. Um, they work. They work great. They're just annoying to hold. But again, personal preference. 
What's next? I probably like it because it's probably made for my size hand. <laughs> Maybe the, the big difference with it is uh, you'll notice on all of these saws, the angle at which the handle is to the plate. Um, on bigger saws, that ang angle is going to be a lower, oops, let me turn this down. See, this one is actually starting to get more vertical, whereas the, do the dovetail saw is down at a lower angle. Um, and that comes to, when you're holding it, that lower angle means that the saw has to be lower for your arm to be in line with it. If the angle on it was higher, that means the saw comes up higher to, for, your for your hand to be in angle with it. Um, so with a gent saw, it's basically taking that handle whoop, and turning it be from being like 30 degrees and then bring it all the way up to 90. So when it's this low, in order for your hand to be in line with it, it's got to be all the way down here. So you've got to be cutting something that's very, very low on you. So if you have a very low bench and something's really well below you, then a gent saw works well. But if you have a bench up at a normal working height, it's just kind of annoying because it's not there. Unless you're cutting something vertical in front of you, which it's almost, yeah, I don't do that. Um, so, <laughs> all about the ergonomics. What's next? Uh, Steven Zwan wants to know, how do you know if a stone has been oiled if you bought it used? Um, you feel it. Um, or you put a little water on it. If the water absorbs into it, then it's a water. Um, if the water just kind of beads up on the surface, then it's oil. But most of the time with an oil stone, you'll, you'll feel that it just kind of has a slight oily feel to it. So Harold Golden wants to know, is it a myth that a well-tensioned plate will sing? Um, well-tensioned plate? It's all plate. Oh, um, I mean, they'll all make a tune. It just depends on what tune you want them to make. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've ever done that. What it is, usually when you're talking about a tensioned plate, it's a folded back that has been set well. Um, but if it's been set well, it's straight. Um, if it hasn't been set well, then it's wavy. And so I think it would be easier to do that than be like, is that a C or an E? I can't tell. <laughs> What's next? So, how's that? I'm re reconditioning a 100-year-old saw and want, to, want the etch to be more evident. Do you have any tricks for staining or coloring the etch? Um, staining or coloring it? No. Um, usually what happens is it starts to get dirt in there. Um, and so if you can clean the dirt off of the plate without touching the dirt that's down in there, that kind of shows up. Um, so, I mean, theoretically, if you hit it all with a Sharpie and then clean it off the surface, um, then you can remove everything that was on the main surface. Um, what I usually like is a scraper. Um, with a good straight edge on there, I can clean off the surface of the plate without it getting down into the edge. Um, if, I, if that's not enough, then I'll go to like an 800 grit sandpaper on a very hard surface. So I'll put the plate of the saw on something hard and then I'll use um, like a metal plate with the sandpaper adhered to it. And I'll use that with a few strokes over it to clean the plate without getting down into the edge. Um, but yeah, that's usually the way uh, you wanna work at it. Something flat and hard. Um, if you have anything that's soft, such as sandpaper in the hand or something like that, it's going to get down into that etch, and uh, you'll wear that out a little more. All right. Kenny and Janet Horn asked, if one is sharpening their first saw, do you start with a larger saw? Uh, yes. Larger teeth are easier to see. Um, it becomes very apparent. And usually, per capita, there are less teeth on a large saw than there are on a small saw. Like, there are more teeth on this dovetail saw than there are on this hand saw, even though... It's a lot bigger. There are less of these to do than there are of this. So this will actually take me longer to sharpen than this will. Um, so yeah, big teeth are, are much, much easier. Plus you can see them. When you start getting down to small detailed teeth, the, the, pain, the problem is being able to see them. It is um, a pain. What's next? Got enough time for one or two more? Uh, at least one more. Let's okay. see. Brandon Jones. James, do you ever use a miter box? Um, no. Uh, it is, it's more work to set up the miter box, um, to get it up and running, put things in it, than it is to just cut the board. Um, once you've gotten the skill to hit a line, you've got a line on the board, you just cut it. And uh, no reason for that. 
Right? If I'm out, I'm I'm out of alignment within a shaving on a uh, um, on a shooting board. Uh, but most of the time, it's well within tolerances just to cut it right off the saw. Uh, so no, I don't, because it just. It, I think the big thing for me, and I've got. Um, I've got two of them in the shop that I, I cleaned one of them up and the other one I'm probably going to be selling, um, is that they just take up space. A miter box is a big thing, and I don't like big things particularly. Say, uh, other than the bench, if something's, you know, that's just space, it's valuable. <laughs> Very. <laughs> is that it? Or we got, oh. I got one more I pulled out. All right, let's do we'll one more done. and call it a night. Alejandro Vasquez asks, have you ever used a Two Cherries brand saw, and would you recommend getting one? Uh, yeah, actually, my this one, yeah, this gin saw is a Two Cherries. Um, honestly, other than it being a gin saw, it's not a half bad saw. It's a really nice, clean saw. It's got a folded back on it. Um, it's really good. This thing, the handle, that's raw. Um, <laughs> but as to the the saw itself, it's a pretty good saw. Yeah. But again, when choosing a saw, the handle is the important thing, not the saw, not the back, not the plate. The handle's the important thing. Focus on that. The rest of it is, you know, you can sharpen it and fix it up pretty quickly. So. You have quite the sound effects tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cool. Uh, I think that will uh, do it. Um, next week, we're going to do the, the Q&A, so uh, stay tuned for that. If you got any particular questions we didn't get to, you can answer them then. Ask them. Ask them then. I'll answer them. I don't work? know that I'm going to be on the live. I might have to work. Yeah, that one actually might not be with, with Sarah. So we'll see. I may not do the Q&A then because it would be more of a pain to not do it with her, to do it without her. So we'll see. Stay tuned, and uh, we'll let you know uh, what we're going to do next Tuesday. So on that note, uh, I think we're done. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.